Well, welcome back to Money on the Left. Our next panel is entitled Aesthetics and Abstraction. First up, we have Rachel Cox. Rachel Cox earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and German studies from Wake Forest University. She is currently enrolled in USF's film, film studies master's program with the Department of Humanities and Cultural Studies. In 2014, she was granted a research fellowship from Wake Forest to do research on horror films from the 2000s. She has previously presented on the Saw series for the Popular Culture Association. Her current research interests are centered on children's animation. Rachel's presentation is entitled Not So OK KO, Neoliberal Anxieties in Current, Television, or current Televised Animation. Thank you, I haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rich. Oh, good. Uh, so yeah, so while my presentation decides to start, I guess I will. So today I will be talking about current televised children's cartoons. And in this presentation, there it is. In this presentation, I will be mapping out a specific trend in modern cartoons and engaging with them in terms of Dr. Ferguson's MMT aesthetic theory, and then in the spirit of that theory, try to explain these aesthetic trends with broader economic trends. So in general, characters in these shows tend to morph and abstract far more freely than characters um, would in a prior era. This trend can best be understood in terms of the anxious neoliberal attitude towards abstraction as mapped out in MMT aesthetic theory. So before I go on, I'm going to briefly review two important features of that theory. First, as Dr. Ferguson explains in Declarations of Dependence, the phenomenological experience of space has noticeably shifted. In classical Hollywood cinema, space was a continuous, uh, was a continuous whole, but it was experienced in a much more voyeuristic, detached way. With the rise of the hyper-Newtonian blockbuster, space was something that was experienced so that viewers would feel themselves in the space. To put that more succinctly, as he does, Hollywood shifted from its role as a dream factory into a business that delivered roller coaster experiences. Now, the other important feature of that theory for my presentation is the way that it maps out neoliberal anxieties. In the neoliberal understanding of the world, money is a very concrete, finite object that almost has to be discovered. Now, MMT, of course, would assert that that's not the case and that money is, in fact, a very abstract and, for governments, a theoretically infinite resource. With the rise of online banking and direct deposit, it's hard for even casual observers to deny the essentially abstract nature of money. However, this abstraction runs so counter to the neoliberal understanding of the concept that um, abstraction in general, including aesthetic abstraction, is actively suppressed. It's evident in moving image culture where because of the nature of the medium itself, abstraction cannot be entirely disposed of. Uh, Ferguson explains that these pictures then deal with abstraction in generally one of two ways. Either it is completely negated and fought against, or it's repurposed so that it's made into something that's much more concrete. Now this component of MMT aesthetic theory is particularly fascinating to me when you consider how it may play out in animation, because animation is by its very nature a total abstraction. Animated worlds are entirely constructed so that they don't even necessarily have to follow Newtonian physics should they choose not to. So with all of that said, let's talk about cartoons. <laughs> For the majority of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about OKKO, OK Let's Be Heroes. In the show, this trend towards greater character flexibility is simply the most evident. I'll talk about later how you can see a lot of these uh, trends in other shows. This flexibility can be seen in the free manipulation of the scale and proportion of the characters, the frequent change in drawing style, and even with the show's changing quality of the animated motion. In fact, one can actually already see the way that the scale of the characters is unstable from just this promotional image. Now, in these kinds of images, at least the ones from Cartoon Network, uh, the characters are generally drawn as their base models and to scale. But this image already shows off some of the flexibility of the character design. I apologize for the pixelation, but the character that I've zoomed in on here is Lord Boxman. Mm -hmm. In the show, he is a very short man, but in this image, he's theoretically presented as being as tall as his factory. And although I will admit this is a small example, um, it's one that's just highly typical of the show, as you will see. But first, I'm going to introduce you to these characters. So the blue man is Radicles. The woman standing beside him is Enid. Next, we have the robots uh, Daryl and Shannon. 
And finally, we have KO's boss, Mr. Gar. Now, although we could look at a number of characters to uh, map out this flexibility, I just decided to focus on these five. So even as the show is going to uh, easily play with the size, style, and quality of motion of these characters, they're still going to be very identifiable by a couple of basic features of their design. So Radicles will always be blue, Enid's always going to have purple hair, and for the most part, you never see Mr. Gar wearing a shirt. <laughs> Speaking of Mr. Gar, I would like to talk about how arbitrary the scale and proportion of the characters are in the show, and Mr. Gar is certainly the best example of this. Now, he's a very buff and a very tall man, but as you can see in these images, <laughs> he's frequently made comically large. In the first image, his head is nearly touching the ceiling, and he's a full head taller than the shelves. In the other image, he's made even larger and more ridiculously disproportional. Uh, his head is easily larger than a small child, and it's probably at least a third of his total height. Um, but there's also a number of less obvious ways that these two images are a grand departure from his base design. So he's certainly an exaggerated character at his base, but he still has a neck, and he doesn't have a neck in either of these images. Furthermore, if you look at both carefully, Mr. Gar appears to be rather chubby, unlike his very muscular but still relatively lean model, base model. Um, but Mr. Gar just provides us with the best examples of these plays on proportion. You can see it with uh, other characters as well, including Shannon and Daryl here. Now, both are roughly the size of an older teenager because they're supposed to be teenage robots. However, in this shot, they are both tiny and light enough to hang off of the very short Lord Boxman's arm. Now, these two are also going to help me demonstrate what I mean by the shifting styles in the show. In these images, we can see Shannon and Daryl abstracting into various simpler shapes and forms. The top two images, to be clear, aren't frame grabs of like go-between shots in a fight sequence. In the upper right image, they actually fully take on that form and kind of just fold on top of one another to simulate the fact that they're fighting. But it's the image on the bottom that's probably the most simplified. In it, we see Daryl and Shannon uh, reduced primarily to simple shapes, most noticeably circles and triangles. And again, this tendency isn't just reserved to these two. Here we see images of Radicles and Enid being variously detailed and simplified. Uh, in the first image, we see a simplified version of Rad with a flattened nose and no eyebrows. Opposite that image, we see Enid with a much more detailed, frustrated expression than her base model would allow. And in the center image, we see Rad's face similarly detailed, but in the image below, all of these taken from the same episode, if you couldn't tell, we see a highly simplified, completely flat version of Rad. Now, so far, I've demonstrated that the scale um, slash proportion and the style of the characters is highly negotiable. However, the, the way that the characters move is actually highly variable. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to play a few clips from the same fight sequence um, in an episode. And this is the part where the technology is going to be very wonky, so I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> so Shannon here is going to be fighting this gentleman named uh, Joe Kappa. In this clip, where she enters, um, I want you to pay attention to the way that she's moving because this is the motion part of the presentation. <laughs> um, and there we are. It's progress. <laughs> So the animation in this clip is fairly smooth and fluid, and it actually does a really good job of uh, keeping Shannon to scale. So this next clip is going to come from later in the episode, when it wants to appear. Um, Shannon is going to jump into the air. Well, she, she will one day. <laughs> So trust me on this, she will jump into the air and transform. And again, uh, pay attention to the way that she moves um, when this decides to show up. So yeah. Hmm? Um, because of this, I'm actually going to just skip this clip. That's fine. It's not as important. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm just going to skip that clip entirely and go to this one. So in the final clip that I've taken from this episode, Joe Kappa is going to punch Shannon, and she's going to get up. Um, I want you to pay attention both to what happens to the fist and then uh, as Shannon gets up to the way that both uh, Joe and Radicles are animated in the background. Oh, there we go. Yeah. 
so in that clip, uh, Joe's fist just kind of suddenly disappears. Um, because we've seen how Shannon can transform uh, so smoothly, uh, even within that clip, uh, that can only be understood as a deliberate choice and not an error. In the background, as Shannon gets up, you might have noticed that Joe and Rad are only moving on two frames of animation. And again, that's clearly a choice. And to really drive that, part, that point home, I do have one more clip. Um, again, note how Shannon is moving and how Daryl is going to enter the frame. I believe in you. Good. Yes. It's quite worrisome. Let's try talking to her. Hey, Shannon. Don't you think we should get back to fighting those lame goody two shoes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like how to get there. So Shannon is clearly moving on only two frames of animation. Unlike Joe or Rat in the last clip, though, she is in the foreground as a subject of the shot. And you can contrast that very easily with the way that Daryl enters the frame. He jumps in and he lands, and uh, all of that motion is fairly fluid, certainly when compared to Shannon. Now, as I said in the beginning, uh, this trend towards greater character flexibility is not unique to OKKO. OK it's simply the show where this trend is most clearly pronounced. All of these shows that I've uh, put up here will freely play with their characters' proportions, scales, and styles. Using the promotional images above as references, uh, it's very obvious how Gumball, the blue cat from The Amazing World of Gumball, doesn't usually look like a character from Dragon Ball Z. Steven Universe is admittedly generally a lot more subtle with the way that it plays with its character's flexibility. But if you look at the image below very carefully, you can notice a few distortions. As far as the show is concerned, aside from one Steven being purple, they're perfect matches. But uh, again, if you look carefully, one Steven is clearly leaner than the other, and the purple Steven has much larger, more expressive eyes. Um, the last set of images come from Adventure Time. In the promotional image, Jake the dog appears at the size that he generally is for the show. But in the image from the cartoon, we see Jake has become both large and tall enough to carry that same human from the promotional image all the way up into the clouds. Now, all of these trends are truly embodied in the rise of shapeshifters in these shows. That is to say, characters who are acknowledged within these shows as being able to change their forms. In OKKO, OK Shannon is just able to transform as her robot ability. Adventure Time explains that Jake can transform because he's a magic dog. And in Steven Universe, although all of the gems can theoretically transform, um, we only see Amethyst do it with any type of frequency. I chose that image because she's literally becoming abstract art. Um, it may seem like so far that these shows have a pretty simple positive relationship with abstraction, but that's only the case with the characters. The worlds that these characters inhabit are grounded, familiar, and generally stable. When the worlds dare to start abstracting themselves and behaving in unexpected ways, it's a problem to be solved or an obstacle for the characters to overcome. The top two images taken from OKKO OK and Steven Universe, uh, the characters are faced with rooms and chambers that don't follow Euclidean geometry. Going back uh, in, so like if you, the rooms are randomized in a way that if you go back in one room, you won't end up in the last room that you were in. Uh, the bottom two images are taken from different episodes of Gumball. In both, in, in both images, the world is falling apart and disintegrating for two different economic reasons. In the first one, the father, who's typically unemployed, gets a job, and the world starts falling apart because it can't handle it. In the second, the main family runs out of money, and so the animated world around them degrades further and further until the characters are nothing more than stick figures on sticky notes. In both examples, the world abstracting is literally an apocalyptic event. I mentioned way back in the beginning that the way that these cartoons are engaging with abstraction is unusual when compared to cartoons from a prior era. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to talk about 2011's Winnie the Pooh. Hear me out. <laughs> so Ferguson has pointed out that Pooh's relationship with abstraction is very light and playful. In that way, Pooh has more in common with mid-century cartoons like the Warner Brothers shorts. The first image is from the Baxen sequence. The characters suddenly abstract into simple chalk versions of themselves and perform in a largely empty, abstract blackboard space. I'm now going, well, Hopefully, I will now play the lead into the honey sequence. Technology willing. Christopher. 
So in both examples, the characters abstract just as freely as the world around them. If you watch the movie, which I recommend, it's adorable, you'll notice that the characters also tend to abstract and morph a lot less than the characters from these shows that I've been talking about. Uh, these char the characters in the worlds in Pooh can abstract and roam into strange places, but there's always this confidence that it's going to return to normal. So the world can disintegrate into honey or become an abstract black space, uh, but that's never a cause for alarm. And so in that sense, the abstraction in Pooh is a bit less anxious. Oh, that messed up the setup to my joke. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend you didn't see it. <laughs> like that didn't happen. Exactly. So, audience, <laughs> how do we make sense of this? I will tell you how. That was bottom test. The relationship between modern cartoons and abstraction is still highly ambivalent. The abstraction has been largely repurposed, such that the side of abstraction has been pushed almost exclusively onto the bodies of the characters. The world remains largely contiguous and grounded, but when it dares to abstract itself, this abstraction is purely a site of anxiety. To further understand this distinct difference in the sites of abstraction, I believe that Dr. Warren Crow's theories on girlhood and animation can be quite helpful. In Girlhood and the Plastic Image, Warren Crow discusses both girlhood and animation as highly plastic concepts. Plasticity refers to an object's ability to both give and receive form. A plastic object can always be shaped and reshaped at a whim. For that reason, plasticity is a highly sellable and desirable feature in an advanced neoliberal economy. She describes plasticity as being able to meet the needs of liquid modernity by remaining life, metamorphic, and responsive. However, she does distinguish that a plastic identity one that is by definition never fully formed, uh, isn't actually employable. But a flexible identity, one that is able to accommodate to a number of uh, situations, is highly employable. <laughs> so with all of these ideas in mind, I submit that we can understand this trend in animation in one of two ways. Mobilizing Warren Crow's ideas about plasticity and flexibility, we can interpret this trend as, mo as a kind of modeling behavior to the young audience um, a high degree of identity flexibility in order to successfully navigate this neoliberal world. This notion is supported not only by the trend of greater character flexibility itself, but by how often uh, these episodes will center on the young protagonist's sudden transformation into a form that is larger, smaller, or just altogether different. Alternatively, we can interpret this aggressive shift in the sites of abstraction as a kind of projection it's like an acknowledgement that the world has become a much more abstract place, but placing all of the abstraction on the actors in the world. Uh, to borrow a phrase that Dr. Ferguson will use, uh, the message that these shows are broadcasting is, they're there. The world is most certainly a stable, concrete whole, but it just may not seem like it because everyone in it is so unstable. The necessity of flexible identities in this moment can be demonstrated by this economic data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. According to this data, individuals had worked about five and a half jobs between the ages of 18 to 24 in the late 70s. But by the late 90s, individuals on average had worked about 1.1 more jobs, and that's a very significant difference when you consider their sample sizes. In this way, we can understand the greater character flexibility as, again, a kind of modeling behavior for the young viewing audience. Yet perhaps even this encouraging attitude towards more flexible, more abstractable identities is itself highly qualified and ambivalent. As I just mentioned, a common premise of episodes in these shows is that the young pr primary protagonists uh, transform. But that's kind of the problem. That's the show's premise, and so it's the driving conflict of the episode. So even if the characters initially enjoy uh, their new forms, they eventually become a point of frustration, and they want to return to their more familiar, more stable-ish base designs. And this, too, can perhaps be seen as yet another reflection of neoliberal angst. Because even as identity fl flexibility is both prized and prioritized, it still belies a deep-seated desire for much more stable, much more easily graspable identity. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome. Next up, we have Michael McDowell. Mike McDowell is a graduate student at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. He holds an MA in American Studies and a graduate certificate in Film and New Media Studies from the University of South Florida, and is currently finishing up his second master's degree in Ethnomusicology at FSU. Upon completion 
Mike will return to University of South Florida to complete his doctorate in communication. Mike's research examines place, the American South, independent music scenes, and neoliberalism. He has presented papers on these topics at the Southern Graduate Music Research Symposium and regional chapters of MLA and PCA ACA. The title of his presentation is The Neoliberal Austerity Money Physics in the Dystopian Survival Game, The Flame in the Flood. Scott Ferguson's forthcoming book, Declarations of Dependence, argues for humanists to shift their focus from the Marxist commodity critique of cultural forms to one inspired by MMT that reimagines a critique that implores scholars to embrace money as a boundless public utility instead of a corrupting force upon aesthetic endeavors. Today I offer an attempt at this sort of critique, one that exemplifies the type of scholarship done in cultural studies, media studies, musicology, and American studies while straying from the typical obsessions with commodity that tend to bog down the discussions in this dis discipline. The Flame of the Flood provides an interesting case study because as an independent game that employs support from both the independent gaming community and the punk rock community, demonstrates money's ability to provide decentralized, localized cultural creation that produces a product that functions as a critique of neoliberal austerity era. The, the Flame of the Flood... Flame of the Flood was released by independent publisher and developer The Molasses Flood. It's a post-apocalyptic video game in a survival genre that makes it ex explicit the inherent tensions of modernity and masculinity. The game establishes and navigates notable binary aspects of masculinity, the mediated and the authentic, the wild and the civilized, the analog and the digital, uh, the independent and the commercial, and the folk and the popular. These tensions are navigated throughout the work with, in the artistic presentation of characters and landscapes, the choice of the musical music and soundscape, and the engagement the player has with the game. The daunting reality of the game is the player never actually wins, and is always destined to die and start the gameplay all over. While this is certainly a nod to existential dilemmas that have grappled, been grappled throughout the 20th century and more contemporary times, this short story form is also reflective of Roland Barthes' death of the author, and this death is applied to the gamer and developer alike. There's little in the way of plot device aside from references to an apocalyptic past, and the player is stripped of the agency to beat the game or have it end more favorably. The simplicity does, not, does point to many beneficial aspects of Barth's argument, most notably that the author's absolute control over text does not necessarily overrule a consumer's imaginative engagement with the text. In this way, players are immersed in an environment where they are simultaneously free to play and imagine a narrative of their own, while ultimately restricted in how their narrative impacts the game's outcome. All we are is what we leave behind, the game reminds us in this announcement trailer and the final track of Chuck Reagan's soundtrack. The gameplay highlights what Ferguson calls the neoliberal unconscious, but the game's nightmarish, gothic, and disturbing imagery functioned as critique of this unconscious. The rules of the game provide what ought to be an orthodox economic utopia. Everything is quantifiable, from thirst to fever, Money in the state are eliminated, giving the player maximum freedom to explore the landscape. And the dreary 9 to 5 work week is eliminated and replaced with the transcendentalist concepts of self-reliance and survival. 
However, by embracing neoliberalism's economic principles and modernism's aesthetic principles, the game is undoubtedly read as a critique of these structures and not an endorsement. The immersive environment is grounded in sublimity that harkens back to the Amer American Romantic artistic movements, as well as modernist movements of the mid-century. The Romantic influences highlight tensions within the sublime, the beauty of the nature with the grotesque fear that it also invokes, a reverence for individual exploration while a submission to nature's complex systems, and an attention to perspective that allows players to understand the scale of the in-game environment. The invocation of modernist art aesthetics by artist Scott Sinclair, however, serves to subvert and reinforce these romantic and modernist aesthetic choices. The characters are close enough to a realistic representation of the human, but also unrealistic enough to be kind of creepy. The landscape is detailed and vibrant enough to simulate reality, but the artist reveals his hand in a way that points to color, form, and, and the digital nature of the video game to distance players from the medium. In much of the same way, the game's soundtrack grapples with the musical tensions of modernity. Chuck Reagan of Hot Water Music fame uh, contrib sorry, contributes to the songwriting, guitar playing, and vocal vocals to the soundtrack. The gothic Americana influenced gruff vocal stylings recall a pre modern folk sensibility that play into, a ta into the taste making suggested by Adorno and Story. The use of Chuck Reagan's music reveals, however, folk's perpetual relationship to modern music, a, a part of a cultural industry. Reagan is not playing traditional tunes. He wrote these songs specifically for a video game that is distributed at a sizable scale. The ultimate irony is that folk music needs modernity and culture industries to exist. Folk is positioned in binary opposition to many early scholars' conceptualization of popular music because popular music was seen as a threat to wiping out these traditional musics. The irony is, however, capturing early oral folk musics require the same recording apparatuses that popular music required. Modernity is folk savior, creator, and destroyer all at once. Focusing outward from the, within the game's structured world into our own, the modern capitalist system from which it operates must also be addressed. The game and soundtrack are readily available on all, practically all web stores, including iTunes, PlayStation Network, Steam, and other digital, digital download platforms. Although it is readily available on mainstream networks, the game was financed by crowdfunding and independent networking. Furthermore, the network of independent music and visual art scenes inhabited by Chuck Reagan and Scott Sinclair provide a mutually beneficial relationship with independ within the independent game and music scenes. Fans and reviewers of independent games are particularly fond of Chuck Reagan's soundtrack and show interest in his work, while fans of independent mu music, including myself, bought the game because his music was featured within it. In the same way that the player cannot escape their in inevitable in-game death, death, it seems, the politics of the game cannot es escape the tensions of modernity. Post-apocalyptic post narratives like the popular Walking Dead and Mad Max speak to a culture that has increasing anxiety about systems that seem too large and unchanging to have any real authority over. And the flame of the flood follows this trope. Where the game is different, however, is a sense of optimism in a quite unsettling scenario. In the same way that the inevitable death gives the player a sandbox to explore and work within, and in the same way that the prevalence of mass-mediated culture requires all contemporary art to be in conversation with it, the player is encouraged to find ways in a rig system to generate the most agency. You may not be able to escape the app store's increasingly large grip on your life, but at least this distri distribution channel provides a way for scenes who might not have otherwise uh, been able to collaborate and create. Uh, Chuck Reagan's soundtrack to The Flame and the Flood draws upon cultural understandings of masculinity through performance of his persona. Reagan's soundtrack draws upon multiple cultural forms to create this persona, musical, performative, textual, political, and historical understandings influence the performed authenticity of his white masculinity. His masculinity, too, reveals cultural tensions, the nuclear family man and the traveling polk and funk musician, the rugged individual folk artist and the postmodern city punk rocker, and the independent fisherman in tune with nature and a, and a guitarist and vocalist in a popular electrified music, and an anti-corporate musician who must sell records and merchandise to pay his bills. In writing the soundtrack to the game, these tensions are manifest and worked out through, through sites as a, of understanding critique politicization, and identity formation. For many in the punk rock community, Chuck Reagan is understood as an elder statesman. statesman. His band, Hot Water Music, formed in the 1990s in Gainesville, Florida, and has released records as recently as summer 2017. In over 20 years of performing, both in Hot Water Music and in his solo work, Reagan has cult cultivated a folkloric status of his own, at times, and, and is at times modestly shrugged off by Reagan himself. The reverence of Reagan's performance of masculinity reveals the values of the scene that he operates within. I need 
Kasabian, Kasabian in our chapter Popular for the Anthology, Key Terms of Popular Music and Culture, summarizes the social exchange of these values and what scholars refer to as subcultural capital. By attaining folklore stat folkloric status within this a countercultural scene, Chuck Reagan's persona becomes the scene's values emb embodied. Since the scene values a particular strain of masculinity, and since Reagan performed these scenes, these ideals, or performs this to the ideal, this allows his performance to be deemed authentic by those who adopt the, scene, the same scene's values. Kasabian provides a crucial way of understanding popular music that will guide the rest of this study. For one, her understanding of the term popular itself in the this, in this same essay provides a model from which I operate. Popular music is at once folk, mass media, and political. Furthermore, her emphasis on scenes necessarily de-emphasize genre. While this essay, this essay investigates what sounds Chuck Reagan employs to articulate his performed masculinity, this essay will go forego assigning these sounds to a particular genre convention. Reagan music, music could op occupy many genres, punk, folk, Americana, country, and video game music, to name a few. But its performed identity is a response and a construction of scene values and not genre values. Scenes inti intimately tie persona to the music, musical work itself. Chuck Reagan's music fits his persona, um, fits his persona which fits his scene aesthetic, which fit the effective motivations of the flame and the flood that the creators desired in creating the game. Furthermore, Kasabian's definition of popular music foregoes for typical Frankfurt School criticisms of culture industry and instead provides a definition that highlights some tension within Frank Ferguson's modern aesthetic product, project. Po as previously mentioned, popular music is always a, already a production of this product and an invocation of folk aesthetics are purely modern as fantasy. The history of ethno ethnomusicology tells us as much. When early comparative musicologists, as they were called at the turn of the 20th century, went out and collected folk songs, they were doing so with the understanding that popular mass media mediated culture would wipe out traditional cultures. However, that very same device threatened that, that threatened the mass extinction uh, served as, as its savior. This tension in the modern aesthetic product is, is the modern aesthetic project manifest. On one hand, an inherent commitment to thisness and authenticity within folk cultures, and on the other, reproduction and simulacra in recording and popular distribution. The first track featured on Reagan's soundtrack shares the same name with the game's title and the soundtrack's title. The Flame of the Flood is a mid-tempo song borrowing from multiple elements of Americana. Drawing from folk, country, soft rock, and his punk rock vocal stylings, the vocals stand out against instrument, instrumental components of the song upon first listen. Reagan's vocal quality is distinctly masculine. The timbre of his, timbre of his voice is, is raspy, intentionally impure, and carries with it the slightest bit of the southern accent. These qualities carry a particular hermeneutic and semiotic value, creating meaning for both Chuck and his performed identity. And for the listener to imbue cultural ethos from the performance. In Bart's essay, The Grain of the Voice, he describes the voice as an inherently meaning-creating and sight of meaning creation before the interference of language. In the penultimate line of his B section, he reveals his ability to unleash an intense vocal growl. During the last appearance of a C major chord, Reagan shouts, chasing horizons over that chord, a stark contrast to his restrained raspy that he's maintained throughout the rest of the song. Reagan's voice has the capability of commanding sonic space, of dominating the landscape with a distinctly masculine growl. Yet, by seeking musical transcendence to embrace the good man archetype, the song's character chases the horizons of the masculine ideal, highlighting tendency for masculine dominance, embracing it, and subverting it in a musical conversation of, of cultural tension. The meaning derived from Reagan's voice harkens back to the mythos surrounding Johnny Cash. Leah Edwards, Leah Edwards writes, the macho image stems from the aspects of his musical performance, especially in his signature deep voice, as well from his rebellious attitude and the kind of proletarian advocacy he infused in his songs. Thus, he can be seen, as, be seen as a forefather for musicians ranging from Irish protest rockers to heavy metal axemen in a highly male-centric genre, to indie rockers. At the same time, however, Cash also, que also questions this construction of masculinity and also gender codes more generally. In some of his lyrics and performances, Cash conveys an uncertainty about gender norms, questions what constitutes manhood, and portrays a suffering and fraught masculinity. Drawing from the tradi tradition of masculine swagger, from Johnny Cash to Elvis, and from punk rockers Glenn Danzig to Mike, Mike Ness, Reagan's deep raspy timbre places him both in the realm of iconic male and subcultural male. Compared to his work in hot water music, his voice is relatively restrained in, this, in the flame and the flood, revealing a tendency to snarl and growl only in moments of musical climax. The Flame of the Flood is Leo Marx's cultural tension manifests. 
most explicitly, the title gives this tension away. On one hand, the flame of the flood is, an, is the anthropological and historical dawn of civilization, the first scientific revolution that created the ability to demand to, for, for, to form community, city, and cultures, but also the source of warfare, destruction, and environmental devastation. On the other, the flood is natural, the wild, and the pastoral. A flood is both benevolent and malicious. It provides life-giving water while possessing the capacity to wipe out entire civilizations with its might. In many ways, modern ideals of masculinity possess both the flame and the flood. Through conversations on masculinity, American men, too, negotiate wider cultural tensions that have manifest in American culture throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. The flame and the flood, both the game and the soundtrack that accompany it, manifest as cultural works that negotiate this dark history of American conquest and the tensions that make good men become bad. Throughout American history, and specifically in the creation of the ideal American West and the trans transcendence the wilderness can give, we have punished those who have already lived there with death and banished those non-whites to the most gruesome aspects of our modern civilization, the prison for example, the prison industrial complex. All we are is what we leave behind is the refrain that ends both the soundtrack and the announcement for the trailer for the game. By recognizing certain aspects of ideal ma masculinity and by creating an environment where restraint is valued, the game creators and Chuck Reagan offer a moment of optimism in a dreary setting. The game takes place in a in place after the world ends, and the game's end is non-negotiable. We're all going to die. However, if what we leave behind is a path for transcendence, a model for restraint, and a new idea of what a good man does, maybe that's worth dying for and being eaten by wolves. The Flame and the Flood functions as critique because of this embrace of ab abstraction. Mainstream video games and music follow a sim similar trajectory to the as the Hollywood blo blockbuster. A, de a history detailed in Ferguson's book. In con quote, in contrast to earlier Hollywood action aesthetics, post-1970s Hollywood, Hollywood labors to ground screen action physically and materially here and now. It does so, moreover, by anchoring the sensorum in a deeply immersive phenomenology that, Scott, uh, that film scholar Frederick Wasser has dubbed a uh, you-are-there you feeling. An intensive thisness thus organizes film and games too and relies upon sound to bring mass, weight, mass and weight to digital appearances through their sustained and often jarring perspectives. And this particular game's embrace of abstraction that functioned as a critique of the neoliberal ideas of thisness. In using modernist aesthetic choice, choices as critique, the game highlights the dystopian oppression of thisness and emphasizes abstraction's ability to liberate aesthetic politics and ec economies from neoliberal money physics. If we refocus our analysis at the level of production, these independent games, gaming and music scenes seem to already know what MMT scholars have been arguing for years now. The creators unironically embrace money through the, through the use of decentralized funding campaigns and independent scenes while providing a platform for critiques of these neoliberal systems. Furthermore, the embrace of independent scenes and understanding money as, as a utility allows these scenes to enable players who provi to, to provide critique to the neoliberal conceptions of whiteness and masculinity. Thank you, Mike. Our last presenter is Maximilian Seho, who earned a BA in economics at the University of South Florida, mm -hmm. where he specialized in the formulation of economic policy at the United Nations. He was a founder and subsequent president of the decorated model UN's organization at USF, and since graduation has been interested in the intersection of political economy and moving image culture. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in film studies at USF, where his research focus on, focuses on representations of cultural desire for full employment, specifically in the German and American contexts. This academic year, he delivered presentations at the MMT conference at UMKC and at, Southeast conference, uh, at the Southeast Conference on Foreign Languages, Literatures, and Films at Stetson University. Max is currently in the process of preparing PhD applications for universities across the country. His presentation is entitled, Inglorious Bastards, Nazi Desire Fully Employed. Thank you. Very good. So, Quentin Tarantino's 2009 film, Inglorious Bastards, sketches an alternate history for the end of World War II and the defeat of the Nazis. In retelling this history, the film avows specific aesthetic and narrative structures that allude to a desire for the figure of the Nazi. Where other forms of media typically deny this persistent desire, Inglorious Bastards embraces it in a Baroque sensationalism. In this paper, I will argue that this desire emanates 
from a particular economic moment in American life, the World War II mobilization. As perhaps the only moment in US history, as perhaps the only moment in US history that utilized the money instrument to its fullest potential, the mobilization enabled the lowest unemployment rate in the history of the United States and marked the triumph of the quote unquote greatest generation of Americans serving in the factories or on the front lines. This triumph is predicated on the Nazi enemy. Without po po political will, without the political will that Nazism induced, the mass unemployment of the depression would have lingered into the future. Hinting at this connection, the film makes specific overtures to the nature of employment obligations in relationship to fighting Nazis. Looking closely at the film, I reveal how it expresses an unconscious dependence upon the Nazi villain. What is more, I shall contend that the film makes evident this desire for the Nazi through its braiding of cinema writ large with the existence of Nazism. Without the Nazi villain, we lose the cinema. In our desire for employment, we create Nazis on screen that stimulate our desire for the Nazi enemy. Paradoxically, the Nazi form is a form we create to grasp for employment in a quest for social care. And as an evocative depiction of this multi-generational quest, Inglorious Bastards discloses and implicates spectators in this repressed desire and permits us to reorganize our political and aesthetic economies around social provisioning rather than war. Let's begin with a clip from the film that inaugurates the guerrilla force known as the Bastards. My name is Lieutenant Aldo Rain, and I'm putting together a special team. I need me eight soldiers. Eight Jewish oh, American soldiers. Now, y'all might have heard rumors about the Armada having this city. Well, we'll be leaving a little earlier. We're going to be dropped into France dressed as civilians. Once we're in enemy territory, as a bushwhacking guerrilla army, we're going to be doing one thing and one thing only. Killing Nazis. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I sure as hell didn't come down from the goddamn Smoky Mountains, cross 5,000 miles of water, fight my way through half of Sicily, and jump out of a fucking aeroplane to teach the Nazis lessons in humanity. Nazi ain't got no humanity. They're the foot soldiers of a Jew hating, mass murdering maniac, and they need to be destroyed. That's why any and every some bitch we find wearing a Nazi uniform. They're gonna die. Now I'm the direct descendant of the mountain man Jim Bridger. That means I got a little engine in me. And our battle plan will be that of an Apache resistance. We will be cruel to the Germans. And through our cruelty, they will know who we are. And they will find the evidence of our cruelty. The disemboweled, dismembered, and disfigured bodies of their brothers we leave behind us. German won't be able to help themselves. But imagine the cruelty their brothers endured at our hands, and our boot heels, and the edge of our knives. And the German will be sickened by us, and the German will talk about us, and the German will fear us. And when the German closes their eyes at night, and they're tortured by their subconscious for the evil they have done, it will be with thoughts of us that they are tortured with. Sound good? Yes, sir! That's what I like to hear. <laughs> but I got a word of warning for all you would-be warriors. When you join my command, you take on Devin. And Devin, you owe me, personally. Each and every man under my command owes me 100 Nazi scouts. And I want my scouts. And all y'all will get me 100 Nazi scalps, taken from the heads of 100 dead Nazis. Or you will die trying. All right, so technical issues aside. <laughs> uh, in 1913, British economist Alfred Mitchell Innes wrote a canonical chartalist essay on the economic formation of societies called What is Money? Within, he argued that debt credit arrangements coerce production as they are centered around an obligation to repay the debt in the currency that it is denominated. 
In this scene we just watched, we see Brad Pitt's character enforce this obligation by figuring the scalp of the Nazi as a currency. He uses the scalp tax to oblige the employment of cruelty towards Germans. In the context of a 14.4% US unemployment rate in 1940, the full-scale mobilization of Nazi killing, of which the bastards are a part of, represents the largest public works program in the history of the United States. Everyone working in this program was tasked with doing one thing and one thing only, killing fascists. Tarantino implicates the audience in this employment with his tracking shot that places the viewer slightly behind the line of soldiers. But instead of killing Nazis ourselves, we are employed in viewing. Both the mass employment of the war mobilization and our position as the sine subject are dependent on the threat of Nazism. The result of this dependence is a configuration of, the po of a post-World War II desire for the Nazi as villain. In Hollywood and in reality, Nazi villainy predicates a social wholeness that war affords by dint of full utilization of the US dollar. The greatest generation was the greatest because they fought the greatest enemy to ever grace the earth. Defined in a dependence, we became defined by our enemy's presence and replicated that presence in media. This replication carries with it tragic consequences as it figures full employment as dependent on, upon brutal war. The film addresses this replication explicitly in its narrative. We can hope it's synced this time. Fuck you. <laughs> and your Jew dogs. <laughs> Actually, we're all tickled to hear you say that. Quite frankly, watching Donnie get Nazis is that's as close we ever get to going to movies. Donnie! <laughs> yeah! Guys, a German here wants to die the country. Oblige him. <laughs> In this scene, the bear Jew is not seen until a Nazi needs to be killed in what Brad Pitt's character calls the closest we get to going to the movies. In addition to this rather blatant dialogue, the archway shot preceding Eli Roth's encounter with the Nazi makes clear that we are all at the movies, waiting for the screen to light up with our desire. In this scene, the bear Jew obliges the Nazi in a triumphant brutality that positions the entirety of the cinema experience of heroism as Nazi dependent. This desire originates out of a desire for full employment and is evident in American post-World War II cinema as a desire for Nazis as villains in cinematic depictions. We don't just love to hate Nazis because of their genocidal brutality, but because their brutality afforded a generation of shared prosperity. The culmination of the film goes even further. It narratively positions the Nazi as the cinema. In this sequence, at the premiere of the Goebbels-directed film that celebrates the heroic triumph of Daniel Bruhl's character, the film presents an unsettling question to American cinematic culture. Just as we enjoy watching the bear Jew brutally murder Nazis, so do the Nazis enjoy watching Daniel Bruhl's character brutally murder Americans with a sniper rifle. Though this sort of association could cause one to recoil and disgust at its implication that we are all just like Nazis, I want to look at it in a different way. I want to strip the association of its Nazi gloss and affirm its socializing potential. The cinema brings people together, Nazis or otherwise. Therefore, we can't just indict the cinema as Nazi dependent and move on. We still need it. The film, in entangling this need with the Nazi form, throws the baby out with the bathwater. The end of the war and the death of the Nazis is predicated by the actual burning down of the cinema. <laughs> 
The end of the Nazi is the end of the cinema, an end that is the natural conclusion of our entangled desire. In our perverse logic, the defeat of the Nazis means the end of the cinema, thus they persist on screen. Before I conclude, I want to return to the theme of social provisioning that ended my introduction. The character that best represents the entanglement of care and desire in Inglorious Bastards is Shoshana, played by Melanie Loren. She owns the cinema in which the Nazi premiere is taking place, and her push and pull relationship with Daniel Brühl's character culminates in the following scene. So in this scene, Shoshana, the owner of the cinema, sees the Nazi on screen, and she cares. She cares for him, the man she has just shot. And that care is betrayed in a romance of death. Her grasp reveals that the desire for the Nazi villain in cinema is a perverse desire for mutual social care. We construct, in our quest for adequate social provisioning, the figure of the Nazi in the cinema to satiate our mutual desire for dependence, community, and employment, all of which were afforded by the obligation to fight fascism. We must not continue to confuse or conflate these desires, for Shoshana's fate isn't one we or the cinema can afford. There's too much caring to be done. And though this final scene is twisted and confused in its romantic tra trajectory, it is certain about one thing. Cinema brings out the care in all of us. We just have to make sure that this care is directed to everyone and not the villainous form of the Nazi. Instead of grasping for the Nazi like Shoshana, we must learn to let go and embrace the potential of the modern currency apparatus and the caretaking it can bring into being. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, so we have, yeah, about 30 minutes on the dot. Uh, did anybody want to open the floor with a question to any of our panelists? Okay, this is question is for Rachel. I wanted you to clarify something about the very first of the shows. I, I'm forgive me, I forget the name. The one with the five okay, characters. Okay, yeah. You were 
very clear whether, I, or maybe I missed whether there was a reason within the show itself for their changes in appearance, because later on you gave all kinds of reasons, abstraction, being connected to disemployment, or who just wants honey, but why do they change their appearance on that show? In OKKO? OK yeah. All right, so the only character that actually has like a kind of diegetic reason given is uh, Shannon, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, that's it. Other than that, like the thing of just like Mr. Gar is suddenly giant. Mr. Gar's head is suddenly way too huge. That's there's no reason given in universe for that. It's just the aesthetic of the show. That's actually why I chose OKKO OK to focus on because it's just like the most obvious overt depiction of that. Well, then my, my follow up is in wh what do you think the show is implying? What I mean for this when and I can't help this. I'm a, I'm an early modernist. What I think of is uh, Rabelais, Gargantuan, Pantagruel, where, where the giants anything between 15 feet and 100 feet at different times, whatever. And in that case, it, you're supposed to believe that Rabelais is both incredibly careless and drunk, and he's just not paying attention <laughs> to the fact yeah. that he's inconsistent about his character's size. So is there anything like that? Is there any explanation? Not really, because, I mean, if you look at the, the technology, because, um, you know, at this point, like, it, it's all done on computers, um, and, like, there there's no reason that they <laughs> couldn't just have it stay consistent mm -hmm. and then just, like, move, you know, like, the, the technology is there. Like, it, it's just something that they've decided to do. And, like, the, 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 the point I was kind of making is that the fact that it chooses to kind of uh, continually shape-shift and distort itself and be weird, it's just kind of, like, a reflection of this kind of uh, instability, this inner instability mm. that's kind of almost uh, kind of uh, construed as like a necessity for the individual. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Pass that one now. This is for Max. Thanks for your paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, one thing, uh, I suppose it's more of a comment, uh, is. Um, both historically and representationally after the fact, uh, the war was, of course, fought on at least two fronts, and fascism was a component, but, um, and I, I don't think you'd think of Japanese, uh, uh, the situation of Japan as fascism as much as imperialism, um, and, and of course the representation, so historically the, that commitment that was uh, kind of offered to the American people was predicated, um, there's this great book by John Dower where he reads the war as essentially a race war, not just a war against fascism. Um, and the, the depiction of the Japanese, the, the way the population was rallied to fight the Japanese was explicitly on racial terms um, and in a very retrograde, kind of dangerous sort of way. Um, and so your argument could actually be flipped the other way and you could tell the alternate history of the representation of the Japanese, of the imperial Japanese, as is the same thing, but it, it makes your argument, uh, I think, very much darker, uh, and 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 not so much a, a, a maybe care, but in a very kind of dystopian sort of way. You, can, can I add one thing to that? Yes. Uh, <coughs> you know, um, the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan by Germany. Um, Japanese were rounded up and put into concentration camps. Germans were not, and I think you could, now, I mean, I'm just flying by the seat of my pants here, but uh, I think that, th that there was an uh, anti-Japanese um, uh, uh, I don't know, feeling, uh, uh, is not the right word, but let's just say feeling that extended for many years after World War II. I mean, so that when I was, let's see, so in the, anyway, in the 70s or 80s, you still had uh, Japanese villains in professional wrestling. Uh, I, I don't know really if you had, it. so anyway, just to pile on a little mm -hmm. bit, here, even though it may not even have been his question, but um, it seems <coughs> like um, 
I mean, does it affect your argument at all? So I'm glad both Andy and Matt asked this question because it's something I have thought about in the past and, you know, space-wise space didn't go into this paper, but it's been some other work that I've talked about on this subject. And I think when we think about the kind of the, the two wars that are happening in World War II, we think, I, I like to think about the, the Japanese and the fight against the Japanese as firmly sitting within American, kind of white American imperial history in fighting against and, and in turning the other kind of lesser, quote unquote, humans that were the Japanese because they weren't white. And so in a way, there's something about the whiteness of the Nazis and how a mid-century American liberal or even, you know, right winger that kind of is leaning towards fascism, that the Nazi form gets at like right deep into the American consciousness and the American soul to the point that it right, I mean, I think I mean there was many Nazi rallies on American soil and, you know, we had to stamp down German speaking, you know, across the country because we were we were existentially worried about a fascist takeover that reflected that. So I think the reason why, and, and it, perhaps it still applies to the Japanese in, in that it lingers as, a, as an ethnic group that we demonize in, in the arts and aesthetics, but the reason why that the, the Nazi kind of persists is because it's such a mirror of American kind of identity in a way that, that challenges us to, to that, that we both kind of see ourselves in the form and that's where this desire, like the desire comes from. And, and that that form was, even though, I mean, the Japanese were closer to our borders and attacked our borders, it seemed to get at a culture, like a, a, a rift in American culture that potentially could have been separated mm -hmm. and that in a way that the Nazis were more dangerous to our identities mm -hmm. as Americans rather than the Japanese because, you know, whether it's the Native Americans or the Af African Americans, we're, we're used to demonizing, quote unquote, other racial minorities. So does that answer your question a little bit? Very good answer. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, I have two thoughts, if I can hold them my, in my head, and one is, I think, is helpful in what you're saying. So if you look at, like, if you know Leonard Davis's work, he's a disability studies scholar. He has um, a lot of books, uh, but one called Enforcing Normalcy, where he gives a history of um, uh, statistics and how statistics is wrapped up with eugenicism. And, and the way that a lot of those thinkers were American and British, and so that, the, and that they influenced sort of Nazi ideology, right? So there you have another kind of historic link for the version of the story that you're telling. Um, the, the other thought I had that was maybe a little bit more complicating is um, kind of stems out of Jeffrey Alexander's work, and he makes this argument that this, these ideas that we have now that the Holocaust is the worst of all evils and that the Nazi is the worst of all enemies and that it somehow stands as this like symbol of like the it's both the uniqueness and the most supreme sort of the worst of the worst was really a constructed narrative that was not in operation during the war or even immediately after the war but gets constructed over like the 10 to 20 years after the war and so I think that what I hear you kind of arguing, I guess what I would ask you to think about or is see if you've thought about it already is sort of like the, if what's happening in, in this film is a playing with these tropes, but those tropes themselves have her historical positions and that, and that the way I'm wondering kind of, that just makes me wonder how you're using a, a kind of very contemporary film to sort of think about what was at stake, you know, many decades earlier. And then I have more questions about music, but I, I won't pass. <laughs> um, so I think, I think that's a really good point. And though, I will also say though that, you know, and, and Brendan's turned me on to this, but there is also this contemporary sense about fascism and European fascism that um, 
you know, like the, the writings of, of, of uh, Orson Welles and him going to Spain and, and kind of, oh, sorry, George Orwell. <laughs> I, I always mix them up. Um, um, him going to Spain to fight, to fight uh, Franco, the Franco regime, and how, you know, he talks about con like the way that, he, that people can connect with each other on the battlefield and that they'll, they'll never see each other again or one will die or one will not, that there's a, there's a, a wholeness to that act and, and I guess the tropes, so to, to kind of put a step before that, I would argue is that the tropes are latching on to that cultural sense. And then, you know, they change over time. And, and I think Inglorious Bastards is just kind of like the most baroque example of all of these tropes. But if you look, I mean, you know, if you look back to the early Bond movies and the villains are, are almost always German. Um, and, and so, you know, Throughout his, the history of American post-war cinema, I think it's, you know, that there's, the tropes sit alongside historical realities. Um, so, yeah, does that, I hope that answers the question. Um, thanks, I'm sorry I missed the first talk, but I have a question for the, the, the latter two. I think building this idea of masculinity um, and, and the idea of sort of care that comes through in the way that we look at conflict in these, these fascist, um, uh, sort of texts, um, or, or fascists aren't interested texts. Um, I was reminded of a story that Edward Baptiste t talks about in his book on the history of American slavery, uh, The Half Has Not Been Told, where he talks about masculinity in terms of slaves, and there were certain forms of resistance where people would sort of want to go down the blaze of glory, and then this sort of other conception of masculinity of sort of the, the long unple unpleasant process of sticking around and looking after the young children who were slaves and things, and that's a very different conception of the sort of glorification of death versus sort of life in, in that process. And I, I was just curious, the social psychological angle you're at seems really interesting and productive. I'm curious if there's a sort of individual psychological angle as well here about, you know, the extent to which this battle between sort of the fascist evil or, or the sort of harms that come out from unemployment and things are something that we internalize as responsible for and feel a sense of needing to hurt ourselves, you know, as, as a sense of that responsibility. Um, and the, the example that I use when I talk about it in other spaces with regards to MMT is, you know, we sort of define our misery I in relation to the other. You know, it's like an ex-girlfriend is causing me to be miserable rather than like I'm miserable because I haven't moved on. <laughs> and like the idea of sort of breaking up or moving on from private capital as the source of our misery and sort of saying actually this is a, an empowering process that exists within ourselves. We can sort of heal ourselves, forgive ourselves, move on and not sort of blame this other for the source of our misery. I'm just curious if you, s if you see that internal psychological battle as sort of parallel or mirrored in the, in the social, social psychological and whether you see that masculinity as, as linked in this sort of self-harmful narrative that we ex seem to reproduce over and over in culture. So um, in a more expanded version of this, uh, I talked about Michael Kimmel's work on masculinity and uh, he actually pretty succinctly breaks down what I consider the two binary forms of American masculinity that kind of track with what you're explaining. And uh, the example he gives is like, you know, pretend you're at a funeral and, uh, you know, they're given the eulogy and they say, you know, he was a good man. What, what, would, what would you list as qualities of good man? It's, you know, uh, he was kind to his family, he was loyal, he served his community, all these things that we think of as good men. And then he says, uh, well, what does it mean when somebody tells you to, to man up? And it's almost the exact opposite. It's almost like, don't pay attention to your emotions, don't you know, blame everybody else for your problems. And so in a, in a more expanded version of this, I highlight that like this, there's that tension, which I think derives a lot from austerity, you know, this austerity politics. Um, and like the fact that um, there's a long history in American literature and American popular culture and it sparked this paper of white men getting really sick and tired of civilization and going out to the wolves and getting eaten by, or going out to the woods and getting eaten by wolves. Um, like <laughs> Into the Wild reads like Werner Herzog's uh, Grizzly Man, which, I mean, there's like tons of these things that happen, like uh, there's the main hermit, pond hermit, like these, there's like folkloric stat Rick Van Winkle, like there's this thing that Americans tell ourselves that like the way to be a good man is to kind of get out of this civilizing thing. So I think that's like, I you know, a very American masculine construct. And I think both of these kind of tease the polar opposites of those kind of constructions. Um, and to add on to that, I really like um, the, the connection you're making, Rowan. Uh, it's funny, I read Ed Baptiste's book before MMT, um, right when it came out, and I hadn't thought about it in a while and, and to kind of equate it to this, but I think you're right that, right, war is sort of like masculine caretaking 
on 10 extreme to the, at its most destructive level. And so when we think about like the 50s and, and then like the subsequent flashpoints in American or Western culture since the war, it's all these, these devolving crises of masculinity, right? So, you know, the maintaining of the nuclear family or the, you know, the Reagan revolution, the way that the nostalgia for the greatest generation era is played is, in, is along the lines of, of trying to, to get back to the, the fight that, that defined, like, you know, the modern man. When they won. Right, when they won, exactly. So then Vietnam is, of course, a black eye to all of this. Um, and, you know, every war since then, essentially, is never, it's, it's never meets the expectation of what, what we want. And so, like, there's a really interesting dance that, that plays with sort of, you know, economics and then the male, the male, the kind of lack that, that the male, ex the masculine experience that is Western culture since the war and kind of this, this like, penultimate moment in which everything went right, seemingly, for, for American liberalism. And, you know, these, these as, as we continue to devolve, quote unquote, further and further away from it, the crisis of the, of the masculine just keeps, keeps kind of heightening. And, and I think there's no, I mean, if we think about, like every, everyone's been mentioning the blockbuster and I had Star Wars up there. I think, I think there's a clear connection between the kind of the nerd culture, masculine kind of attachment to these blockbusters and you know, the Luke Skywalker figure who's gonna defeat the, the Darth Vader you, you know, daddy um, figure who is the, the, you know, the Nazi that we can never quite get, get back to. So uh, as, a, as a good point. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Our friend Matt likes Star Wars. That's um, I was just, I had a question. Um, um, for Mike, actually, but I was going to just as an insertion between Marie and your point, it occurs to me that the sort of missing the mass mobilization that was the World War II effort is also something that only happens in retrospect, right? <laughs> it's only in looking back that we realize, damn, we really did something then that we've never ever done since. So the fact that it's a retroactive construction along with yeah, what good. you were describing actually kind of works quite well. And you might think about <laughs> that as you go forward. Yeah, I'm thinking about like Spellbound, which comes out in 45. Mm -hmm. There's no Nazi enemy. The German is uh, a grandfather of the Polish Jews. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that these things might have arose together. Right. And yeah. so you don't So you don't have to, right, and you, you mm -hmm. sort of mine the, the moment itself and, and try to find evidence or lack of evidence and then try to historicize what's going on during the post-war period, what kinds of new anxieties and problems and failed promises are, are, are you know, precipitating that are then retroactively recuperating the, world, the war and the Nazi figure who might not have been this kind of eroticized um, other the way, the way it would become. Well, because uh, yeah. almost before the uh, war was even over, the Russians became, the Soviets became <laughs> the enemy, mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, um, yeah, I think. I'm glad you brought that up because I think the, we, we needed to try and replace then, like, you know, at the, you know, at, at every level of American culture, that enemy, but Soviets, they never quite, they never quite did it for us, right? They never quite got us to the finish line. You know, we, we raced to the moon, we did all sorts of things with public infrastructure. Now, you know, you could argue that there's, there's certain ways in which that enemy affected those, that spending, but we never quite got back to full employment. And, and, and of course, the whole thing that, kind of, I want to untangle is, is that relationship in itself, that, that we need that, right? We could just, you know, the, I mean, so it's funny. Um, it could just be, I think uh, Jean said this the other night, like the new enemy could be climate change, right? But, but I still think that it's worth, even if we would say that, it's worth disentangling the relationship so that we can see what 
mobilization is on its own terms and not like on our, our own terms, kind of what, what, uh, what Rowan was talking about, instead of always looking around trying to find the new thing that will induce this, this capacity that we clearly have. Have you read um, <clears throat> Destructive Creation? And I forget, I can't think of the author's name right now, but it, it tells a history of the post-war period, basically as pretty much as soon as the war ends, there's a big propaganda machine that went into telling the story that America was won, the war was won by private industry mm -hmm. and government got in the way more than it did. And then, then, it, then it helped, right? And you know, this, this, this history obviously, you know, the historian obviously said, like dispels this myth. And yeah, like, yeah. You know, there's plenty of instances where that's not, I mean, there's more instances where it's not the case than where it is. Sure. But there's like, but he, he focuses on the, like the public relations campaign that like Maytag uh, and Ford uh, got us out of World War II and not FDR. And like that start, like it starts during the war um, and and it, there's like a, I mean it's been like two years since I've read it but yeah you should check that out just as like where this kind of where like the the Cold War comes into play yeah interesting um, I definitely will that's great okay so the question I had for Mike oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to make that successful um, so I'm actually getting ready to teach and there are several people in the classroom in my class um, Melancholia this coming week I don't know if you've ever seen Lars von Trier's Melancholia um, but if you pay attention to the prologue of that film, you know th how that film is going to end, which is that a small planet is going to crash into the Earth and the Earth is going to end, right? So it reminded me in a way of the game that you're describing. So too, um, if anyone's ever seen the horror film Cabin in the Woods, but mm -hmm. it also ends with the world being destroyed. And these are interesting to me because when you take these other examples that you gave, like Walking Dead um, and other sort of Mad Max, post-apocalyptic fiction, it's always about rebuilding the world, right? And so what you end up with is watching characters who variously converge and depart from what was there before the apocalypse and how much do they end up rebuilding a world that resembled the world before. And usually the narratives of this is that, yes, they just end up rebuilding the same world that we saw before and therein lies all the problems, right? And that these, these works that either end in the end, <laughs> right? Or you know from the get-go that they're gonna end in the end, have a very different dynamic because there is no rebuilding that is left to compare. It, it really is sort of a reimagining of an entirely different order. And so for that reason, I was curious about having to describe more the actual gameplay because I don't know what it would look like. Like what do you do if you know that everything you're doing isn't going to last. Conceivably, you would do other things. So what is it that people do, right? Right, right. Um, okay, so once, like this is a bigger project, and I try to get as much, there's like a lot going on in it, so I try to get as much um, as possible in there. So um, the gameplay is really, it's kind of like Frogger. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, it's, it, the gameplay is like the, the least interesting part about it. Like, you draft, and they showed it, like pretty much what they showed in the, the trailer is what you do. You draft on a river, you find like former spots of civilization, you harvest it for, you know, commodities to help you live, and then like eventually you drink it, or it's like, it's like Frogger meets Oregon Trail, where eventually like you drink like tainted water and you get <laughs> sick and you die. And that's just like what you do, and like it's, a lot of, so this goes into like the history of indie gaming. A lot of indie gaming, from what I understand it in my limited experience with it, is really obsessed with subverting the big multi-billion dollar video game industry now. So like a lot of indie games are kind of going back to like the Mario era with the platformers and like a lot of these like very like simplistic uh, early video game types. And I think this is kind of doing the same thing where like instead of having like, a, you know, a Grand Theft Auto game where you've got, you know, a, a two-scale model of the city of Los Angeles to play around in. You've got a river, so I think it's kind of it's kind of doing the same thing that like folk revivals do, in that they're kind of taking like a pre-now moment and readjusting it for like contemporary critiques of the current moment. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Is there any kind of different relationality sort of offered? Though? I guess because when I melancholia, for example, what's interesting about that is as the world is coming to an end, for the first time you see a sort of reorganization of kinship and intimacy for the <coughs> first time in that entire film, right? That it actually does produce 
new relationships to the world and new relationships to each other, which is different than I would say something like Fight Club, where it's just sort of the awe of watching capitalism come down, right? There's no other, well, I guess they hold hands, but that's still a heterosexual couple. I don't see how that's that, that, that sort of reimaginative. So is there anything in the game that reimagines relationships, or do you just sort of bide your time until you die? Um, so for one, the game's structure, um, as far as the character creation, um, and like I said, there's more to this, but there's a completely gendered reading of this, where um, you can pick uh, what kind, of, what breed of dog you have in the game. So you have a dog that helps like sniff out whether the water's bad and stuff like that. That's like a feature. But, you, but you're a female character, and you can't pick that. It's the characters. So like, um, but the gameplay, from what I, like what I read on the forums, what players are like into about the game, is the crafting aspect. So like, um, you can get. Uh, old fishing line and like a stick and make an arrow and then you can like hunt and then you can make tra you know so it's it's more of like a crafting game so the the sandbox is like surviving but like the player's own agency and what they do in these conditions um, but I, but the game is like really authoritarian in, in like all these neoliberal ways like it you can't pick who you are you don't pick your character's name that's like unheard of in 2018 gaming in you know the blockbuster games like you you know players want this kind of like submersive thing and this game is very much pointing to like no we're not doing that we're trying to distance you from it um so yeah i think like like i said the gameplay is like the worst part about it like it's not actually like that fun of a game um <laughs> it's got like a really mediocre like review online but like just the aesthetic choices and the the ways it like plays with these con conventions of like modernity really interested me and what players get like i said the, the thing that players get out of it is this kind of like built-in economy of like austerity of um, everything is measurable, so you can see what your fever is, and then there's a meter that goes down. There's hunger. There's there's like 18 different meters that you have to monitor while you're crafting. So like that's the gameplay. But like I said, it's not it's not like well done. It's just like you know this an independent musician and this independent artist kind of collaborated to make a game out of what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh, my question's for Rachel. Oh, yay. Um, <laughs> um, in your presentation, the cartoons you talked about were all um, American cartoons, and I know you yes. have an interest in non-American cartoons <laughs> um, as well. Do you yeah. notice these um, trends in like abstraction and whatnot happening in non-American cartoons? And if so, like how does that fit into like the framework of what you talk about? You mean anime? <laughs> I might mean that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I can't say I've really um, super looked or attended to, like, how it may happen in anime. Um, God, just because that, that's it's such a different beast. I mean, but off the top of my head, the only one I can think of, I can't, I can't remember the character's name, but the big guy in Kill a Kill, that's the only one that comes to mind, though. Um, you know, I, I know I, I know vaguely about Parasite that it's also kind of like squishy and like metamorphic, but um, I can't say I have really considered that very carefully. No, um, although there is a huge emphasis on the uh, transformation in the magical girl genre, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> we got time for one more question. Okay, so um, my question is for you, Michael. Um, like when you say white masculinity, is that just the same as like Western or American, or is there like a specific difference between say uh, like American white masculinity versus American Asian or American black masculinity? Um, so, so white masculinity, white masculinity as in what used to be the default masculinity, um, and so uh, like all of these kind of figures, they're really ambiguous. So. Um, you know, at one moment, Clint Eastwood is has a southern accent, and then he's got like a midwestern accent. You know, like these, the, like like what, what, where they're from is not really important. And uh, like I said, in the expanded part of this paper, um, I argue that like, um, you know, at one end of the spectrum you have like authenticity, and the other end you have like arbitrary. But I argue that like the performance of that is kind of where it meets. So um, where uh, like masculinity is not arbitrary. Like everybody kind of has an idea in their head what that what they mean when they say something's manly, whether that's good or bad is you know dependent on the sub person what we're talking about, and but like, so it's not ar it's like performed and what I what I'm kind of arguing is, uh, different scenes kind of set up their own definitions of what 
what that means. So like in Chuck Reagan's case, in his particular punk scene, um, it's kind of like it's jokingly called like dad punk because like it it embodies like the good man thing. It doesn't. It's not like really aggressive. They mostly play acoustic guitars, not electric guitars. So it like operates. And so what I would argue is like the scene kind of creates their own definitions, and then it the scene kind of defines its values based on those performances. I guess if that makes sense. But yeah, I mean it's different for. I mean, the game takes place in like an ambiguous West. Um, and uh, there's a history of, I mentioned earlier, there's a history of making the West explicitly white um, and like a both federally sponsored and like private industry sponsored quest for making the West like the whitest place in America. There's like a pretty good body of literature that ex you know, makes that explicit. Um, and so I think in this scene, they're kind of critiquing that history um, of whiteness and masculinity. Well, thank you to our panelists.